And uh, thank you also for the invitation that gives me the opportunity to present my, my work. I have to say that uh, I've been really impressed by the work that uh, is done here by talking with uh, the guys uh, in these two days. And um, I hope that you will find my work uh, interesting uh, as well, but uh, we will see. And uh, uh, we'll start by saying that uh, surface plasma resonance, the acronym is uh, SPR, is an optical-based technology that uh, allows the study of uh, the interaction occurring between macromolecules. As you can see here, the SPR technology has uh, been uh, more and more exploited uh, during the last 20 years in a variety of uh, uh, fields of research. And uh, this success uh, is, uh, at least in part, due to the fact that uh, by SPR you can study uh, very different molecules, starting from small, molecular, uh, uh, small molecules, uh, such as those uh, used in drug discovery, arriving to very big aggregates, uh, such as uh, viruses and uh, exosomes. Um, returning to small molecules, I wish to point out that very recently we were able uh, to successfully analyze a series of uh, uh, small uh, chemical compounds down to 300 uh, Daltons, uh, resuspended in the MSO, that as a matter of fact is a very difficult uh, uh, experimental conditions. But beside small molecules and uh, big aggregates, uh, how can I say, the, the main dish of uh, SPR still remain protein-protein interaction. And the interaction of protein with uh, nucleic acid, that is of big interest uh, in your institute, and uh, with sugar. Sugars that uh, are uh, um, one of uh, my interest, uh, and I will return on sugar-protein interaction further on in my presentation. Beside the type of molecule that uh, can be analyzed by SPR, it is also interesting to look at the fact that by SPR is it possible to study uh, interaction uh, endowed with very different affinities. Starting from a very weak interaction, such as those uh, occurring between uh, small drugs uh, and therapeutic target, overall during uh, the first phases of the drug discovery process, arriving to very, very strong interactions, such as those uh, that uh, occur between uh, receptor and their ligand, but overall between monoclonal antibodies and their specific uh, antigens. As you can see here, as a general rule, an Iger affinity of binding also identifies a Iger specific binding. But uh, I will try to convince you that sometimes uh, in drug discovery, it is better to have uh, to work with uh, molecules and with, with a lower affinity, but that retains uh, a larger broad of uh, um, interactive capacity. And I am talking uh, uh, about uh, multi-target drugs. The next uh, couple perhaps three slides uh, are about uh, the biophysical basis uh, of uh, uh, surface plasma resonance. I will not enter into the details here, mainly because this is not my province, so that uh, I will not talk to you about evanescent waves or plasmon, but uh, I will tell you only that uh, a typical uh, SPR apparatus is composed uh, by a prism that is fitted uh, with a glass uh, that in turn is fitted uh, with a gold film that is the core of the apparatus. Under the gold film uh, there is a fluidic device, uh, while over the gold film uh, there is a light source that emits uh, a polarized beam of monochromatic uh, uh, light uh, that is reflected by the gold film and detected by an appropriate optical detector. This uh, laser beam is uh, reflected with uh, a particular resonance angle, and uh, the resonance angle depends uh, on the refractive index of the material that is uh, uh, above and near, we're talking about uh, 300 nanometers, the gold surface. It is expected that uh, if the composition of the gold film changes, also the resonance angle will change accordingly. 
And uh, how can we modify the composition of the gold film? Classically, by, by immobilizing one of the two molecules that we are studying for their possible interaction. In this case, the immobilized molecule uh, is called the ligand, while the second molecule possibly participating to the interaction, that is called analyte, is uh, injected in the flow channel. Now, of course, in this, uh, during the injection, if the analyte does bind to the immobilized molecule, you have a further modification of the resonance angle, and this last modification represents the proof of the interaction between the two molecules. In the uh, SPR apparatus uh, is embedded a software that transforms this uh, modification of the resonance angle of the refractive index in something that we call sensorgram. Sensorgram is a graph in which, in function of time, we report the increase of the resonance unit bound to the sensor chip, bound to the gold film. So that when we immobilize the first molecule, the ligand, we do observe an increase of RU molecules, of RU units, I beg your pardon, that is irreversible because usually the uh, immobilization of the ligand to the gold film is uh, obtained chemically as and uh, is irreversible. So that uh, we have here generated a new baseline. But what is more interesting for us uh, is uh, what happens uh, when we inject the analyte. We have, of course, uh, two po different possibilities. The first, the, the analyte does not bind the ligand. And in this case, uh, you have no modification of the new generated uh, uh, baseline. While, hopefully, if uh, the analyte uh, does bind the ligand, you have a further increase uh, of uh, the uh, RU um, number that, in this case, uh, is reversible. Because uh, in the flow channel, we inject a defined volume of analyte so that uh, at the end of the injection, we observe the spontaneous detachment of the analyte from the ligand. Which kind of uh, uh, data, of information, can we retrieve from a sensorgram? The first, by measuring the maximal uh, resonance unit bound to the ligand, we can uh, uh, calculate the ligand analyte molecular ratio. That means the stoichiometry of the interaction. Also, by the stepness of the association rate, the, beg your pardon, the stepness of the association phase, the software calculates the association rate that gives us an idea of how fast the analyte binds to the immobilized ligand. In the same way, actually in the reverse way, from the stepness of the dissociation phase, we calculate the dissociation rate, or k off, that give us an idea of how fast the analyte detach spontaneously from the immobilized ligand. Finally, from the ratio k off, k on, we can calculate the dissociation constant, kd, that, as you know, is uh, inversely proportional to the affinity of the binding. That means uh, an IKD, let's say micro millimolar, means a weak interaction, while a low KD, uh, as classically uh, we obtain uh, in study of uh, uh, antibodies that correspond to about pico nanomolar in the range, uh, identify, of course, a very strong interaction. Now, Usually, we are asked to calculate the affinity because this is considered the most important parameter in an interaction. But uh, I will try to show you here that uh, KD is uh, important indeed, but uh, it is not uh, um, enough to uh, characterize uh, an interaction. Here are reported four different sensorgrams that, of course, correspond to four different uh, uh, interactions. And uh, by chance, in this case, all these interactions are endowed with exactly the same affinity, Kd equal to 10 nanomolars. But uh, you can easily 
see here that the binding events are quite different. At least the shape of the sensorgram are quite different. Let's focus on the blue sensorgram. You see how the association and dissociation phase are in the, characterized by a high stepness. This uh, identify very rapid association dissociation cycle. This means that uh, the two molecules bind and detach very, very rapidly. And this is classically found in uh, growth factor receptor interaction because this kind of interaction must be tightly controlled and uh, must be stopped uh, at any time because uh, the um, mm, stimulation uh, given by the growth factor must be uh, controlled very tightly. A completely different situation is those uh, in the yellow sensorgram. You can uh, appreciate here that the analyte binds to the mobilized ligand uh, slowly, but was, what is more important is that once the analyte is bound to the um, immobilized ligand, it detach very slowly. And uh, this uh, identify a very stable interaction that is what is typically researched in drug discovery and in antibody screening. Means that what is important is not uh, how fast uh, on, of, or how strong an antibody binds uh, to the uh, antigen, but it is important that uh, it does not detach because this prolong the uh, uh, therapeutical benefit of the drug or of the antibody. So that uh, in uh, antibody screening or in drug uh, screening, uh, very often it is uh, the K of and on the KD, the parameter that is uh, um, first researched for. Now down to technical uh, issues. Uh, in uh, each uh, uh, SPR analysis, the first uh, and very crucial step uh, is the immobilization of the ligand. And uh, to this purpose uh, are commercially available uh, a wide array of different uh, uh, substrate. This is uh, the aspect uh, of uh, a sensor chip uh, on which you see here the gold uh, film. The fluidic device uh, divide the uh, gold film uh, in two different cells uh, the first on which we typically immobilize the ligand, the second that is used as a reference flow cell to um, evaluate the specific binding and for black subtraction. Uh, how to immobilize the uh, ligand? Well, mm, we usually, uh, in almost all our analysis, uh, we use this CM sensor chip that, as you can see here, is composed by a gold film, and uh, there is pre-mobilized this uh, methyl dextran with uh, carboxylic residues. The uh, immobilization of the ligand, typically a protein, uh, occurs between the carboxylic uh, residues and the amine group of the protein. You uh, can easily guess that uh, in this configuration, the immobilization that we obtain is a random one, meaning with this uh, that only a fraction of uh, what we have effectively immobilized on the gold sensor chip is uh, properly oriented and uh, available for the interaction with the analyte. But uh, I can assure you that uh, this is not of no consequence. And the proof of this is that uh, the main part of our analysis uh, uh, are performed with this approach, independently from the random uh, um, immobilization. Another uh, sensor chip that I'm uh, mentioning because uh, we have uh, largely exploited it is uh, this uh, SA sensor chip that uh, uh, is simply a C uh, carboxymethyl uh, sensor chip with pre mobilized uh, streptavidin. And this is uh, um, exploitable for the immobilization of biotinylated ligands. Also in the case you suffer of the limit of the random immobilization. While uh, when you use the NTA sensor chip, you 
automatically obtain a control exteric orientation of the ligand because uh, the uh, ligand in this case uh, must be represented by a fusion protein, a protein fused with uh, an histidine tag so that uh, you have uh, all your molecule uh, immobilized and uh, oriented, properly oriented, all in the same way on the, on the sensor chip. Being the issue of orientation so important, beside the histidine NTA solution, uh, other solutions has been, have been uh, devised as well. And uh, this solution um, mainly are, are, basically, um, are mainly based on the use of a capturing molecules. Uh, capturing molecules that can be as you can see here, anti-GST antibody or protein A that are immobilized on the carboxymethyl destran. They suffer of uh, the uh, random orientation, but this is of no consequences. Those uh, molecules properly oriented can be exploited to immobilize a properly tagged protein. In this case, a receptor tagged with the GST in case the capturing molecule are the anti-GST antibodies of, or FG if the capturing molecule is represented by protein A. In this case, of course, we will generate two different baselines, the first for the capture molecules, the second for the receptor, while the third and last sensorgram is the one that will characterize the interaction with the analyte. In this case, there is a receptor immobilized and a ligand um, uh, injected in the fluidic cells. Last but not least, because we have recently uh, used successfully it, um, the L1 sensor chip that is a simple uh, carboxymethyl dextran that has been modified with hypophilic anchor. And this uh, allowed the mobilization of uh, liposomes, uh, exosomes, uh, viruses that uh, um, allow the retention of the lipid bilayer structure. And uh, this is something uh, that uh, allow um, BACOR, uh, SPR analysis uh, in uh, more uh, physiological environment because uh, in this configuration you have a membrane-like environment. So from uh, the wide array of sensor chip available and uh, the different uh, experimental approach that has been devised, you have uh, a equally wide array of uh, um, possible choice uh, of your uh, immobilization procedure. You can start from very simple, uh, very easy immobilization here that, uh, however, are very far from the physiological situation till those situations that are instead very close to the physiological situation. But I can assure you these uh, models suffer from stability, reproducibility, and uh, it is very difficult to control the uh, uh, SPR analysis because uh, of the instability of these models. Okay, uh, given this background, in this second part of the presentation, I will show you what we have effectively performed and obtained by SPR uh, at the University of Brescia. Um, University of Brescia, where I uh, coordinate the work of the Macromolecular Interaction Analysis Unit, that as a matter of fact has a very funny acronym, uh, that is MIAU. And uh, at MIAU, we um, have uh, two different uh, uh, SPR apparatus, the older one, that is the BIACOR X, and the recently acquired BIACOR X100, that is uh, more powerful, by the way, is the um, uh, apparatus that by which we were able to analyze uh, those uh, small molecules I have mentioned uh, before. This was something otherwise not possible to do with this uh, uh, apparatus. And this shows you how this technology is uh, proceeding uh, and uh, developing new solutions. With uh, this uh, um, equipment, we have been active in basically three different research areas. We have analyzed plenty 
of uh, uh, interaction uh, uh, that contribute to the process of angiogenesis of cancer. We have worked hardly in the field of virology, and we have also contributed to the development of new biosensor of, or uh, new material for biosensing. Uh, here, mainly by using SPR as a golden standard, comparing the performance of SPR with uh, this new material or these new uh, biosensors. In this uh, three field of research, uh, we have uh, performed basically three type uh, of uh, experiments. The first uh, is the demonstration and characterization of selected interaction. I mean that uh, we are given two different molecules and ask it to demonstrate that uh, these two molecules uh, interact and uh, possibly to characterize uh, the uh, type of interaction, to calculate the uh, kinetic parameters I have mentioned before. This type of study can be ideally put downstream to uh, molecular modeling. I mean that uh, by molecular modeling uh, you suggest a particular interaction and we are asked to demonstrate the effective interaction by using real uh, molecules. But also this kind of study can be put uh, downstream to prediction of biological activity. We demonstrate an interaction, and this uh, demonstration triggers a series of uh, experiments uh, in vitro and in vivo to evaluate uh, the biological relevance of the interaction we have demonstrated. The second type uh, of uh, uh, study is the identification of new drugs. We are given a therapeutic targets, usually a protein. We are given a large library of uh, uh, molecules, and we are asked to find out which of these uh, uh, molecules is uh, able to bind the uh, biological target. And uh, also in this case, this kind of study starts a series of further experiments in vitro and in vivo to evaluate if the, hit, the hits found in SPR are indeed able to exert a therapeutic benefit in the appropriate in vitro in vivo models. The last area of research, the one that I consider the, more, the most interesting but also the most challenging, is the use of SPR to decode the interactoms. A few words about interaction, I think that you already know what uh, it is it. Um, the network of interaction is uh, um, what we commonly refer to interactome. Uh, every physiological process or pathological process relies on a complex network of interaction among countless molecules. And the importance of uh, the study of the interactomes is uh, uh, proven by the always more growing number of uh, publication in uh, this field. Actually, until uh, some time ago, I'm not so young, so that <laughs> I, I remember uh, this uh, period, a particular biological activity was thought to be the result of a very straight lineal sequence of events, starting from the releasing of an angiogenic growth factor, in case of angiogenesis, of course, by a producing cell, the interaction of the specific angiogenic growth factor with the specific signaling receptor, the signal transduction, gene transcription, and then the biological activity. And this basis was what started the search for monotarget therapy. Today, we know that uh, this same activity, angiogenesis, is, uh, in truth, the result of countless molecules. At least, uh, here are uh, uh, listed 14 different uh, classes of uh, uh, interaction. Uh, before all, we know for sure that uh, angiogenesis in vivo is never never due to a single angiogenic growth factor, but to different angiogenic growth factors that contribute simultaneously. These angiogenic growth factors, before to reach the target cells, can be intercepted by a series of free binders. Then 
once uh, reached uh, the target cells, usually to fully activate the cell, the angiogenic growth factor needs to interact with different specific receptors uh, simultaneously. The complexity of the extracellular interactome is mirrored by the intracellular interactome, by all those interactions that you know very well, that occurs inside the cell between second messenger with themselves, with the receptor, transactivating with nucleic acid, cytoskeleton component. So that this is the real situation. And the comparison between this former uh, interpretation and this somehow explain uh, the limited clinical benefits that uh, are uh, uh, obtained by monotarget therapies. Uh, briefly, in angiogenesis, in, uh, in, uh, onco in the oncological um, area, antiangiogenic drugs were very promising, but today we know that they are not enough to block uh, uh, tumor growth when used as a single agent. The same goes for uh, antiviral drug research, that except for uh, um, particular cases, vi viruses are still a top global healthcare problem. So that uh, these considerations call for first identification of novel therapeutic targets to be chosen between all uh, these uh, presented. And the second, the development of multi-target uh, drugs that uh, by inhibiting different uh, targets simultaneously are expected to exert uh, a more effective uh, therapeutic benefits. Each binding event uh, in uh, an interactome uh, can be considered a target for the development of new drugs. Beside this, uh, we have to face with the fact that the current approaches in drug discovery rely on the screening of large library of compounds. These two things uh, together uh, makes the fact that uh, the decoding of the interactome, as well as the screening of the drugs library, call for fast, reliable, high throughput technology. And uh, on this basis, uh, we wonder if uh, SPR may meet, at least in part, uh, this kind of requirements. Uh, the, the study of uh, interactomes uh, usually lead to the drawing of uh, connectivity maps. Connectivity maps that uh, uh, are usually um, performed on one single protein, in this case an FKB, and can be drafted manually, and in this case are simpler, or can be drawn by uh, dedicated software. And as you can see, when the computer works instead of uh, men, the complexity increases uh, in, in, uh, in an apparent way. SPR has been effectively exploited to draw connectivity map. In this case, SPR has been used to draw the connectivity map of endostatin, an inhibitor of angiogenesis. So that uh, dealing with a single protein, SPR and many other methods are successful to draw connectivity map and to study the interactome. But the challenge is, uh, beside single protein, to draw interactomes for whole processes pathological or physiological. For example, the interactum of selected virus or the interactum uh, of the whole process of angiogenesis. This, of course, is expected to need the collaboration among various laboratories, not only by one laboratory. This is well explained by the next uh, couple of slides. This is the angiogenesis interactum as we have uh, angiogenesis, I beg your pardon, connectivity map, as we have drawn by our own study by SPR. Some angiogenic growth factor that interact with some receptor and with some uh, extracellular matrix components. This situation has to be compared with the angiogenic interactive map that can be drawn when I add 
to our data, all the other data that are available in literature. These are all interaction demonstrated and characterized only by SPR. And you can see here that uh, we, fa we are faced with a very complex situation. And I, I can assure you that uh, this is not uh, updated because uh, I have drawn this connectivity map, let's say, six months ago, and now there are many and many molecules to be added. Um, dealing uh, with the connectivity maps, uh, uh, associated to the uh, concept of connectivity map is uh, the concept of hub molecule. Hub molecules are those highly connected molecules that are important because their inhibition can affect the multiple pathway uh, that can be compared to the administration of multiple drug. And uh, this kind of approach that is uh, a multi-target approach, once again, is expected to affect multiple nodes of a particular pathological process, uh, leading to the overall, hopefully leading, to an overall failure of the disease-related system. Returning, uh, beg your pardon, uh, once identified a, a hub molecule in a connectivity map, of course, this uh, hub molecule must be molecularly characterized for example, identification of binding domains for both the hub molecules and the interactants, and uh, suitable antagonists must be searched for uh, those uh, hub molecules. And this, again, is usually performed starting from large, lar uh, large library of molecules. These goals, again, call for fast, reliable AI through output technology. And once again, we wonder if SPR can be used to this aim. Returning to the angiogenesis connectivity map, to the angiogenesis interactum, it is apparent that the most important hub molecule in this environment are heparin and heparan sulfates proteoglycan that are highly connected with tens and tens of molecules involved in the angiogenic process. A few words about heparin and heparan sulfates. Heparin, free heparin, and uh, the heparan sulfate chains associated to several proteoglycans are uh, polysaccharides composed of uh, repeated disaccharide units that are variable, variably uh, sulfated. The sulfated groups of heparin and uh, heparan sulfate chains are very important because it is through these sulfated groups that occurs mainly the binding of all the ligands that bind to free heparin and to heparan sulfate change. On the heparin binding protein, the sulfated groups usually uh, interact with the cluster of positively charged amino acid, lysine and histidine, that uh, are referred to as basic domain. Heparin is uh, easily exploitable in SPR because uh, due to its uh, saccharidic uh, repeated structure poses no problem of orientation so that we can easily biotinylate heparin at its reducing end and then uh, I mobilize uh, uh, biotinylated heparin to the um, sensor chip with uh, pre-mobilized uh, streptavidin. In this uh, condition, you closely resemble the situation that a ligand find on the surface of a target cells where there are a lot of proteoglycans presenting, projecting these heparan sulfates chain for the binding. Uh, so that uh, this uh, sensor chip with heparin has been the center of many and many of our research. And uh, this kind of sensor chip has been used mainly in two ways. The first, the simplest, is to uh, analyze the capacity of heparin to bind various molecules. And, uh, to characterize, of course, the kinetic parameters of the binding. We have uh, used uh, this uh, approach uh, in many cases, 
And uh, here is uh, a list of the molecules that uh, we have been demonstrated to bind to heparin by exploiting SPR. And uh, you see that uh, this is uh, somehow a connectivity map itself, a glycomic interactum of heparin with molecule in the field of angiogenesis, of inflammation, and uh, with the viral proteins. Some selected uh, examples. This uh, was uh, a work in which we were faced with uh, the uh, requirement to demonstrate the capacity of gremlin, a new angiogenic growth factor, to bind to heparin. Here is a classical overlay of a sensor gram obtained by the injection of increasing amount of gremlin on uh, immobilized heparin. And uh, once obtained the demonstration that uh, gremlin effectively bind to heparin, we wonder, as I have already anticipated, if this binding, binding was biologically relevant in vivo. This has been done by uh, comparing SPR data with data obtained in a plen plenty uh, cell uh, models. And uh, what we were able to demonstrate had, was that as well as gremlin binds heparin uh, in SPR, Gremlin is also able to effectively bind heparin sulfate proteoglycans on the surface of these cells, and the binding was functionally relevant. More important, the affinity by which Gremlin bound to heparin in an SPR environment was practically comparable to the same affinity value that was calculated by binding affinity with cells. And you can easily imagine that, that these experiments are very uh, difficult and are not for sure real-time experiment as instead are those one. So that, in conclusion, SPR was predictive of what we uh, can observe in, uh, in vitro. And this means that this model can be, for example, used to screen for anti-angiogenic molecules directed against uh, gremlin. Another example. Here we have been asked uh, to demonstrate if a protein of HIV, P17, the matrix protein P17, was able to bind to heparin. Panel A, you see uh, the sensor gram of the injection of P17 on the cell containing uh, uh, heparin, while this is uh, the aspecific binding of P17 on the flow cell containing only streptavidin. And this gives you an idea of the specificity of the signal that we are looking. This is again an uh, overlay of sensor gland obtained by the injection of increasing concentration of P17 on heparin. These are blank subtracted sensor gram, this subtracted from this. And this is a saturation curve obtained by using the RU bound to equilibrium. And this is the consequent sketcher plot analysis. So all this data demonstrated that P17 bind to heparin. In this peculiar case, the next question was different. And uh, was, uh, our question was, can we use SPR to identify the heparin binding domain of P17 so that it was not a biological characterization, but we returned to a molecular characterization? In this case, we started from data obtained by molecular modeling. Look at the figure in A. This is P17. And it has been identified two different basic domains, one in the N terminal of the protein and the other in the C terminus of the protein. Both these basic domains were more or less composed by the same number of basic domains. They were exposed on the surface of the protein, so that we were both equally candidate to the binding to heparin. But surprisingly, 
the molecular modeling predicted that heparin does bind to the N-terminal basic domain, but not to the um, C-terminal basic domain. And faced with this particular result, we wondered if this situation could be demonstrated effectively by SPR. To this aim, we designed and produced a mutant of P17 in which the N-terminal domain or the C-terminal domain were neutralized by substituting the lysine uh, residues with alanine. And also, we were able to uh, produce a deletion mutant in which the C-terminal domain was deleted. These mutants were compared to wild-type molecule for their binding to heparin in the SPR. And as you can see here, the N-terminal uh, mutant, the mutant in which the N-terminal basic domain was neutralized, completely loses its capacity capacity to bind to heparin, while the uh, mutant with the C-terminal basic domain neutralized or deleted still retain their capacity to bind to heparin, so that SPR validate the prediction of the molecular modeling. The second type of experiment, and I have quite finished it, okay, the second type of experiment that uh, we uh, performed with heparin was uh, to analyze uh, putative, to analyze, beg your pardon, to identify and uh, analyze putative inhibitors of the binding of a ligand with heparin. These are classically competition experiments that uh, are performed basically to identify putative antiviral or antiangiogenic compounds, at least in our lab. The first example is an old one, but still effective. Uh, we had this uh, from uh, the University of Leuven in Belgium, these uh, four uh, compounds. They are synthetic sulfonic acid polymers that are uh, reminiscent somehow of heparin, at least because they have, you see here, the um, sulfated groups. And uh, we... Uh, try to understand if these compounds were able to inhibit the binding of both TAT and GP120 to heparin. That is reminiscent of the binding of TAT and GP120 to the heparin sulfates of target cells. So that we were looking for multi-target drugs able to uh, inhibit two protein of HIV simultaneously. The first experiment, of course, uh, was uh, the simplest one. We pre-incubated the single uh, compounds with uh, uh, the two molecules and uh, injected these uh, compounds on the heparin surface. And as you can see here, the presence of uh, the uh, sulfonic acid uh, com almost completely inhibited the binding of TAT and of GP120 to the heparin surface. The medium through output and the real-time nature of SPR allow us also to perform very long experiments in dose response, so that we had four different molecules against two different targets in different dose response. And by this kind of study, we were able to calculate ED50 for each of the uh, sulfonic acid polymer that we had available. Now, this is, however, an experimental uh, condition that, uh, how can I say, is uh, very far from uh, what would be the uh, real situation found by a possible drug after its administration in vivo. I mean, in this case, uh, we allow the molecule to bind to, ta to, to TAT or to GP120, and only then we inject, expose them to the heparin. In vivo, a drug is expected to find the target already bound to heparin sulfates uh, proteoglycan. So that uh, we uh, performed another experiment. We injected the protein in the absence of the molecule. 
waited for uh, the equilibrium phase, and uh, only here we injected the uh, drug. And what we can see is that also in this experimental condition, the drug retains its capacity to disrupt the already established uh, interaction of the ligand with heparan sulfates proteoglycan. Uh, uh, the last uh, um, model, I will not enter into the detail here, you know that uh, an inhibitor can act by different mechanisms of action that are classically a competitive mechanism of action and uncompetitive and non-competitive mechanism of inhibition. With SPR, by performing a linear wave bark plot, that means to challenge different concentration of the drug to different concentration of the target, we were able to obtain this plot. Uh, in this plot, uh, the peculiar disposition of the lanes that intercept here uh, allowed us to um, conclude that PSS was uh, uh, working with a competitive mechanism of action. This means that uh, the PSS go and bind exactly the same basic domain that he used normally by heparin. And this is somehow expected because uh, I have uh, told uh, you that uh, uh, sulfonated, sulfonated polymer are uh, um, structurally related to, to heparin. Finally, probably the most important thing, those compounds that were able to bind to heparin in SPR was also able to compete with uh, heparan sulfates proteoglycan of uh, uh, the cells for the binding to TAT and to GP120. And the inhibition of the binding of TAT and GP120 to the heparan sulfates uh, proteoglycan of the cell surface also lead to an inhibition of those biological activities that are at the basis of the pathological effect uh, exerted by TAT and GP120 in, uh, in target cells. In conclusion, uh, in our hand, SPR has emerged as a profitable methodology to decode angiogenesis and HIV interactome, to demonstrate and characterize selected protein-protein or glycan protein interaction, I uh, talk about this, verify in silico molecular modeling, predict in vitro and in vivo behavior of cytokines of viral protein, and last, to identify multi-target product, as I have uh, um, shown you for TAT and GP120. These are two uh, reviews that uh, we have uh, um, wrote about the impact of SPR in uh, virus host interaction and uh, in uh, angiogenesis, and uh, these, are the, these are the acknowledgement. Uh, Chiara, Paola and Antonella are the three um, researchers of my group. Uh, these are uh, the grant uh, almost uh, finished up uh, apart from this uh, on which I have based my uh, work and I wish to thank uh, Marco Presta, my former boss, uh, uh, for his help. Thank you very much for your attention.